I need some traction. You need some traction. Hey everyone, Lloyd Lobo here, co-founder at Boast AI. We're automating tax credits, billions in tax credits for innovative companies. Traction webinar is brought to you by Boast AI Launch Academy in partnership with Growth Lasers, Founder Institute, Lazaridis Institute, and BCF Ventures. I'm super stoked for today's session because one of the all-time gurus of big sales, hundred $100 million playbooks, building massive companies is here with us, Hunter is the CEO of Venna Solutions, which recently raised a 300 million Series C, which is massive. And he's been a longtime sales executive and leader at HubSpot, taking them from 80 to 600 million in five years, so almost 10x. He also brings experience from Salesforce when it went from 2 billion to 4 billion, and he helped grow the Canadian business of ADP from 30 to 300 million. And what's most interesting is post ADP, Hunter took six years off to raise his family. And that resonated with me probably more than anything. I mean, um, you know, relationships transcend companies. And the most important thing in life is relationships. And you took six years off to raise your family after that, building companies like Salesforce, HubSpot, and now Vena. And you've had a massive hand in, in mid-market growth. And you're going to share your playbook, <laughs> achieving 100 million ARR. I think we started the session with saying, enterprise is overrated and focus on mid-market, but, uh, but really we're going to talk about how do you identify the right market for your company at the right stage. So welcome to Traction, Hunter. I think 2021 is going great for you, isn't it? Yeah, it's been great so far. And, and uh, if you want to spend the entire session on my six years off raising kids, I'm happy to do that too. It was, it was a wonderful time. Um, but the, yeah, 20, 2021 has been great so far. We, uh, we do have a little more growth fuel for Kind of the fire we're bu building here at Vena, and uh, and on the personal front, the family is is surviving a little less personal contact with friends and family than you know any of us uh, would have imagined we'd have to this point. But we're we seem to be uh, surviving just fine so far. Awesome, and Lily 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 is uh, tuning in from Austin. Incidentally, I'm in Austin right now. Like everyone in Silicon Valley, I'm also moving to Austin. And then what a pleasure, right? When you have former colleagues, uh, Hunter join into your session and say things like, uh, Hunter is a legend. It's a pleasure to know him. Should be a super informative webinar today. So Steve Zavasky, who spent six years at HubSpot working with you, says that. <laughs> Phenomenal. Warms my heart. Awesome. So let's dive into your background. Impressive background with Salesforce, HubSpot, ADP. How did you get into all of this? Uh, better avoid going to work early, actually. I exited university and I thought I was going to build a bit of a, a professional or semi-professional career playing soccer, doing my best to stay out of real work, and then uh, realized that, uh, that I wasn't nowhere near talented enough to do that. And um, I actually found my way into uh, sports event management early in my career. And uh, because I had a, a bit of a sports background, I thought that might be a place to spend some time. But I, I kind of quickly realized that you know, I was working 80 hour weeks and getting paid about 20 K a year. And that there was a lineup of another, you know, hundred or 200 people behind me that were happy to take my job for 20 K a year because everybody wanted to, you know, work with the Raptors at the time or work with, you know, this is back in the nineties when the world cup was in the U S and we had a, a contract with Adidas doing world cup stuff. And then I chatted with someone who was in go to market, someone who was a, a, a good friend of mine, and was selling technology and and he just said hey this is why it's great you, you you're in front of customers you're solving problems you work super hard you make great money if if you do a good job and uh, and i pivoted and, and joined adp uh adp payroll hr time and labor management as as a, a sales rep and i actually truly loved the work and within a few years uh, I was fortunate enough to get moved into sales leadership. I think the only reason I got pegged for that is because I was like clearly the oldest person in the room. I waited too long to start working. And so when the first sales leadership job came up, it was like, okay, the old guy, we're going to give him the job. Um, and Cause I was in a room of folks that are probably four or five years younger than me. And then just continued to scale with ADP. It was a wonderful company. Actually, if you think about SaaS, ADP is really the pioneer of all things SaaS, right? Because they basically offered, you know, remote access to compute power for a regular recurring fee. 
that's effectively in the entire ADP model. And so, you know, it, it, you know, it was framed as, you know, outsourcing, but really it was, it was all things SaaS. It was remote access to compute power, which, which then turned into rolling out payroll on the internet. We were one of the very first companies to do, uh, to do true uh, B2B uh, in a SaaS world, we called it ASP at the time, a- Application Service Provider. It was the early uh, innings of, of SaaS. And so I'd kind of grown up in this recurring revenue, you know, remote access to, uh, to software and technology environment um, my, whole, my whole life. And I did about just about 10 years at ADP. And then to your point, I decided my, uh, uh, my time at that point was going to be better served helping to raise my my two boys. So at the time they were six months and two years old, and my wife and I just decided we got super lucky with ADP. The company scaled from about three to six billion. Um, the stock plan had you know split, doubled and split a couple times, and so we kind of had a bit of a nest egg. But rather than save that for retirement, we decided we'd spend it while we raised our kids. And so to your point, that's where I spent six years off. Uh, which was wonderful. And then when I came back, I got really fortunate and someone, a really great leader at salesforce.com had uh, enough courage to hire someone back into a leadership role who'd been out of, out of work for six years. Um, uh, it was Michael Bash at salesforce.com and he, he took a bit of a chance on me and I, I had a wonderful run there about four years uh, scaling that company and really being a part of a wonderful culture and team. And then I took a bit of a risk on HubSpot pre-IPO and we did some special stuff there. And, and then again, uh, I wouldn't call it a risk, more of a next step in my journey to, to join Vena as CEO just under two years ago. So it's been, a, it's been a really fun ride. And I think I've been just super fortunate to be in the right place at the right time with lots of great people around me. And um, I'd love to think that I had some role in that, but I do think it's you know, part of a rising tide floating all, all boats. And I'm definitely one of those boats to this point. You know, Hunter, good things happen to good people and you're a great person. What a testimony to, to a great human that you are. One, taking six years to raise family, and, um, and, and two, I've interviewed over 100 people in the last year, right? We do two webinars a week. And I have never had a speaker where so many of their past colleagues are joining to give you props, right? Hill says here, huge Hunter <laughs> fan, worked on his team at SFDC, previously was somebody from, from HubSpot. And I had another person, great person and former manager, Hugo says here. Mm-hmm. So this is just phenomenal, right? Like karma comes back, uh, you've done some great things. What made you take the CEO role at Vena? Introduce us to Vena and and why did you join the company? Uh, So, uh, yeah, Vena is effectively a a platform for uh, finance and operations professionals to kind of plan and run the business. So you think about the front end of, you know, how you build your plan to connect strategic operational and financial plans together. Uh, Lots of people use Excel or Google Sheets or uh, Anna Planner, some of the big ones for sales ops. But think about a kind of a mid-market planning engine that really helps companies effectively run better. And you can do the back end too and you know, do your close management and financials and all that, but it's basically a, a complete planning platform. Um, Canadian founded company support from uh, Vista JMI and Santana. So really well, well funded, uh, a great, great company. And at the time I was at uh, HubSpot and we were on uh, a rocket ship and HubSpot continues to be on a rocket ship. It's a great company doing wonderful stuff. Um, and I was reporting directly to the CEO, Brian Halligan, who's awesome. Um, but I just, I had a pull, a real strong pull to see if, you know, all the stuff I had learned working with great people in the past, great leadership teams, if I'd learned enough to be able to help a company scale. We were about 25 million uh, US ARR when I joined and the, the goal is to get it to 250 million. And so this was a chance for me to take on, you know, a new role, a smaller company than I'd ever really been at before, uh, but a great company, great customer great customer base, a really great culture and people. Um, and it happened to be Canadian founded and I'm Canadian. So uh, there was a bit of a pull there to also come back to my roots and try to see if we could build, you know, a, a great Canadian success story out of primarily out of the Toronto office where our, our head office is. And so, so that was the pull. It was a chance to do something interesting to test whether or not I'd learned anything that could be useful to uh, a company like Vena and to see if together we could build something special. And, and that was the pull. Awesome. That is that is fantastic. So let's let's get into your time at Salesforce. You take this break, you know, somebody takes faith in you, brings you to Salesforce, you are VP commercial sales with them from 2010 to 2014 when they grew from two to four billion. What did that look like? How do you how did you manage to grow such a large amount? What was the overall strategy? So Salesforce, it's a bit of a phenomenon, right? When when it first started, the uh, the idea was that 
you could bring enterprise grade functionality to how companies thought about managing their sales process and their pipeline. And, and so that in of itself, this idea that, that, you know, smaller companies, mid-market, you know, lower end of enterprise could tap into what only large, large enterprise companies could in the past because of this new deployment, this new uh, internet-based deployment. That was the kind of genesis. And folks generally thought about the fact that it was this really enterprise-grade B2B solution that you could deliver over the internet as being the hook. I don't think that was the hook. The hook was actually that for the first time, truly, a sales engine could demo how software could make an entire company better by showing the buyer real-time exactly how it worked, not just how it worked, but how they worked within the software. So this idea of drinking your own champagne became through technology, through kind of internet uh, connectivity became real. Like you didn't now need a, a, a team of seven solution consultants and, and sales engineers to, to mock up a software uh, demo and then bring out an entire team and a, and a big projector into a boardroom to show what it might look like. You literally could open up your browser. You could actually log in as the seller to your instance, show that company their view, their profile within Salesforce and tell them here, here's who I reached out to. Here's the history of my, my connection. Here's how the, pro how the product is helping me suggest what actions I take next with you. How does your sales team do it? you know, Mr. or Mrs. VP of sales is it, do you do it like this? And all of a sudden you'd have all these eyes wide open that said, no, this, like we don't do anything like this. This is amazing. And it's real time. And I believe you. And so all of a sudden the ability to create trust and credibility through a sales process around tech, all of a sudden went from mostly people not trusting the, you know, the screenshots and mock demos to seeing this as being live, this actually works. I have a lot of faith and trust. And so all of a sudden, Salesforce built this kind of trust momentum, which allowed sellers to not have to overcome that trust barrier that always happens when you're trying to uh, engage for the first time and build brand and trust. And so, so Salesforce had this really interesting flywheel of how do you continue to improve on the product, continue to use it better for yourselves and drink your own champagne and get really good at showing people how you drink your own champagne. That to me was was the hook. And then, you know, Parker and, and, and Benioff got really, really smart and said, this is a great product, but one day we are gonna build a platform. And how do we create this ecosystem around? So, you know, in my time at Salesforce, I, I learned the value of execution, like the value of just doing it great, which is how do you show, how do you build and show value through, uh, through uh, sales and product and marketing and events. You know, Salesforce was a top-notch event producer. So how do, you, how do you execute really well to create demand? How do you build a really healthy ecosystem around your product and actually create an economy around the product? Um, and then how do you actually uh, lean into uh, where the world is going? How can you get a really interesting message out there that says the world's changing, we're a part of that change, you should be a part of it with us. So there's a lot of future, you know, future kind of proofing yourself if you hooked yourself into Salesforce and if you built around using their ecosystem, you knew they were just going to do the job well because they were using their own products and they were showing you how it worked. That to me was exciting to learn over a number of years um, at the, in that engine. And it's still it's still paying off now. They're, they're continuing to grow and scale and do great things. What would you say were the key pillars to growth during that time and, and the lessons you took from there to HubSpot? So again, I do think it's, it's execution and it's ecosystem. If you think about all things Salesforce, it boils down to that. They are an execution engine and they've built a really, really healthy ecosystem around them, not just technology, but service partners as well. That's the strength. One thing that I think that Salesforce, you know, probably claimed to have that I, th I think HubSpot already did better when I joined is a true community around a sense of purpose rather than around a product or a technology is HubSpot really, by the time I joined, had already started to build this interesting community that says, we should think differently as marketers. We should not just be this old school interruptive, you know, outbound marketing profession. We should actually figure out a way to make marketing you know, kinder, gentler, more effective, more helpful, more context driven. How do we create this inbound flow? So, so HubSpot at the time I joined 
what was so exciting for me is that HubSpot had this mind share that so far outstripped the market share. The, the way people thought of HubSpot significantly outweighed how many people were spending money with HubSpot because the community that was being built around them was so engaged and so active and people were learning from the content. And every time they engaged with the brand, they learned something new and they shared it. And so all of a sudden you had this big flywheel of community uh, and brand and trust being built before they, you know, the, the business had really sold much. And I, it was about a 70 to 80 million ARR business when I joined. And you could just see that we had so much room to go because like I say, there was a deficit there. Mind share was so big and positive, market share was low. And if you think about um, some of the more traditional technology companies we've all seen grow over the last 10, 20 years, if you ever were in go to market there, you would feel the other way. You'd feel like, oh man, our market share was good, but mind share is low. People don't really like working with us. They're not really engaged with our content. They're not building community. So all of a sudden market share high, mind share low, that's a real grind in a go-to-market engine. So if you, as you're building a company, as you're building a brand, if you can flip that, get mind share leading your, your push on market share, you've got real advantage. And that's what I saw in HubSpot and that we were, you know, we were poised to take advantage of. You made a few good distinctions here and comments, but I'm, I want to encapsulate it into one statement. What I heard was fall in love with your customer and make them successful beyond your product or service. And um, if, if you build a community, you will not become a commodity. But you talked about ecosystem and then you went into community. What I understood from that is ecosystem is building relationships around your product and community is building relationships or, or basically growing on a mission that's bigger than your product. Is that yes. accurate? Yeah. Cause yeah. Cause when you think about the, like a technology platform or ecosystem, it tends to be about the uh, interconnectivity of the technology and the way you can monetize all that interconnectivity, right? You've got people building on it. You've got other, other uh, tech plugging in, Community is different, is, is this idea that the professionals, the individuals within that community who happen, most often happen to use some of your tech, but that your goal is to make them better at what they're doing, whether or not they spend money with you. Like you're, tr you're truly in it to help solve a set of problems that you find super interesting, that you're really curious about, that you're gonna try to continue to learn about, that your community can help you learn about. You're trying to solve a really interesting set of problems to you that you think as a brand, you can have real impact on in terms of how the world solves these problems over time, that you've got a better point of view on how we together can solve these problems. And, and again, it's that rising tide that we can make our profession, it starts off as a marketing profession or a sales profession or a finance profession, we can make our profession better. We can make the companies that operate within our community better at what they do. They can hire more, they can launch new products, they can go into new markets, they can go international because they've learned through their, you know, their experience and contact with us and we've learned through them and it becomes this really interesting kind of a virtuous cycle of learning and growing together. And if you really believe that and you apply time and energy to that, you can, like I say, start to build mindshare through community that effectively pulls you, it drags your market share along and starts to pull you. And now you're chasing mindshare with product and with selling motion and marketing motion and product-led growth motion. And that all starts to kind of feed itself, which is, which is really what you're trying to do is to, to, to build some momentum there through, uh, through your community and, and, and your ecosystem. You don't want to, you don't want to step away from how well your, your technology, you know, builds uh, around a platform and ecosystem, but community matters a bunch. Yeah. And, and, you know, the bulk of both growth through our series A has come from community. We effectively built traction. It's got 110,000 subscribers today. We're not as deliberate as promoting our brand in the community. And maybe we should do that looking into the future. But I feel community is a strong mode. If, if there's no differentiator other than price, then what differentiates you, right? And, and that, that could be your community uh, having to have a big part in that. So you helped HubSpot grow revenue almost 10x. You said you joined at 80. When you left, they were like 600 million. Um, you talked about community enabling a lot of that. But how did the team decide in terms of where to focus on, you know, yeah. HubSpot effectively has made a name for itself in SMB and then mid-market. You don't really hear about enterprise, uh, HubSpot playing in the enterprise space a lot. 
And even when we were evaluating more and more companies say, oh, you know what, if you want to go into enterprise, you should just move into Salesforce. And I'm mm-hmm. like, dude, the, you know, cust- the user experience matters a lot. Right. And, yeah. and so how did you guys do that? How did, how did yep. you decide on what market to focus on? There is a bunch of nuance in how you sell and build predictable demand and execute against revenue in different segments of the market and, and whether you've got a horizontal solution and you segment by size of company or decision-making uh, motion or whether you're going vertical. So there's a bunch of nuance in there, but with uh, with HubSpot, we were primarily a horizontal solution, right? There's this idea that at the start, everyone needed uh, content management system, everyone needed marketing automation, you needed email management, and eventually everyone needs uh, a form of a CRM, light, lightweight to more complex. And so we were a pretty horizontal solution. And so the way we thought about segmentation, where we're going to spend our time, because we built um, such a great community and had this kind of inbound motion going, we could actually assess demand, like where we were naturally getting pulled which parts of the market were naturally pulling and interesting, interested in, in our products, whether that was by geography, right, to drive international expansion or by a segment, uh, by segmentation in terms of where we saw most of our, you know, high, high intent demand being generated. Um, so we had a lot, of, a lot of kind of leading indicators of where demand was coming, which helped us make some decisions on, on investments. And then we obviously dug in a lot to the data and we got to a point where, you know, by the time I joined, there were there were thousands of customers, probably about uh, just under, probably just under 5,000 when I joined. And so we had enough data now to say, okay, when we looked at all the unit economics, where do we see the best return? And so when we when you think about that, the natural you know natural tendency is what you're going to see is your customers that you're selling to at the higher end of the market probably have higher gross retention, probably higher net retention, they're probably buying more and likely a significantly higher cost of sales. And so you kind of do all your, you know, your LTV to CAC and your economics couch and you start to see, and if there is a material difference, you can start to lean in to that and say, okay, well, this part of the market tends to, tends to retain is a little more profitable, but you have to go a bit deeper. Are we well positioned to compete there? Do we know our unique value and our unique selling motion there and unique distribution leverage? And is it strong enough to compete with the incumbents? Because, you know, especially when you think about enterprise, so many folks are drawn to the enterprise because of, you know, bigger ticket items and likely uh, better retention. Once, once larger companies make a call and implement, it's harder to unwind that. So they stick around longer. And so there's a natural pull there. But when we looked at the data at HubSpot, we said, no, we're, we're about a lighter, faster way to create value. We're going to put some guardrails around this. We're going to deal with the part of the market that is comfortable with our, you know, our contractual, our legal, uh, our commercial terms. And we want to make those light, repeat, repeatable, almost like click through commercial terms. So super light. We wanted to sell to the parts of the market where we knew we could sell at pace, which was an inside sales model, eventually moving to product led growth. And so what part of the market is that, which is not at the time, like this is many, you know, uh, call it now seven years ago was not the enterprise enterprise wasn't buying through, you know, through video conference, they were still looking for people to show up in front of them. And so we did a bunch of that math and said, you know what, all the things that we know we can do really well and where we're seeing demand and what we know of the market where we think the market is most underserved and where people are actually staying away is the high end of SMB core mid market. People are afraid of it. They're worried about churn. They're worried about like the the effort to find a customer who then uh, exits. They're worried that that part of the market's not going to want to sign multi-year deals. They're only going to want to go month to month. And so there's a bunch of fear in there. So if we can get this right, if we can kind of skate to where the puck's going and get this right and know that mid market and SMB companies are going to be buying lots and lots of technology and scaling and they're going to they're going to technology to compete, right, to help them compete with larger companies. We think we've got a really interesting point of view, interesting technology, and that looks like really great unit economics and a great way to sell fast and often to a big part of the market where we know there's lots lots of demand and where they need help. They don't need just technology, they need methodology, right? And I think that's when you think about creating long-lasting brands, it's where people go not just to use their product, 
but to understand how to better do their job and, and HubSpot, we thought we were really well positioned to teach people how to be better marketers and better salespeople and better service people. So we, we thought we had unique advantage down market where we could really teach and educate and partner with a partner ecosystem, like a service delivery ecosystem, do you know impactful things in the markets we chose. So we did all of that and focused down in the, what we call kind of the top end of SMB, a core of mid-market. That's where HubSpot's focus was. And this is a really important point. I feel like I'm you know, lecturing a little bit. I don't want to be, but something that took a lot of time to learn and made a lot of mistakes in my career. What we were trying to do in identifying that market is to help us build the best possible solution set, right? The best possible product to solve the problems that are most often seen in that part of the market and then pair it with a go-to-market motion that is most applicable for that part of the market. And keep in mind, that does not mean you won't still sell big customers who are willing to play by your rules. You won't sell to small customers who are willing to pay your fees. Your market will be much bigger than what you design for. But if you don't design for a specific market that you think you can service at the highest levels, you're never going to get this right. You're going to be trying to design for all sorts of segments and all sorts of use cases. You need to design for a particular set of problems for a particular part of the market that you know you can do really well and then build all the go-to-market and community behind that and trust that you're going to sell a bunch more. At HubSpot, we had an enterprise sales team. We sold a bunch of stuff to the enterprise. It's just we didn't go after companies who wanted us to change our product roadmap or who wanted us to indemnify them to levels that were going to crush a company of our size. So as long as the enterprise customers wanted to play by our reasonable rules, we're happy to sell to enterprise. And we had a, a bunch of success doing that. And as long as the, you know, the under, you know, sub call it sub 20 or sub 10 employee companies uh, had the financial wherewithal to buy and leverage HubSpot and get real value out of it, of course, we were willing to sell to them too. It's just not who we designed for, right? We didn't design for very small. We didn't design for enterprise. We designed for the core mid-market. And because we made those decisions, it helped guide all of our product, go-to-market, marketing, community, all of our partnership, it guided everything we did and allowed you to, you know, create real momentum in a part of the market that we thought we could do well in. Yeah, and definitely, right? It starts with your customer and you got to be really deliberate with that customer because then you know who the partner ecosystem is, who they buy from that you can partner with, who they, like what events they go to, what they, where do they eat, breathe, drink, and sleep. And, and you can dominate that sphere. When you try to be too many things to too many people, you end up being nothing to anyone. Um, and so that's that's a good lesson here. I want to dive into how should founders think when they are going through this debate of do I go up market or not? Mm -hmm. Like how, what what should they consider when they're thinking about uh, about going up market? I think if I think it first starts with the problem you are super passionate about solving and super capable of solving at a at a high level, right? If that that's what it starts with, and the problem set of an enterprise of a Fortune 100 company like a global company is different than the problem set of, you know, 50 employees scale up on the West coast. Uh, those are, that's a different problem set within finance, within HR, within, uh, or even on the uh, consumer side, if you're serving consumers, there's different problem sets uh, all over the world in terms of how they buy. So I guess the idea at first is make sure you're defining that problem set. If that problem set that you really, really want to solve sits up market and it's best uh, served by selling to enterprise, then you've got to go through that that step lower, which is is are we equipped to compete up there? Because even if there's you know a crappy solution to the problems that you know you can serve better, there is an ecosystem up there, buyers of uh, partners of suppliers. There's there's momentum up there already that you're fighting against, and to disrupt that requires typically a lot of money and energy to overcome what is a fairly change averse part of the market, right? Enterprise is fairly change averse. And so you've got to get super thoughtful about how narrow your value proposition is, how easy it is to sell, uh, what you're looking to displace, how strong the, the buying ecosystem sits in the market you're trying to disrupt or displace and make really thoughtful decisions on where you want to spend your time. The same kind of dynamic happens in small if you, you know, if you're serving a, a, a problem set that is primarily small local companies that don't want to scale, they, there are eight, nine, 10 employees, they're happy with what they're doing, but there's, there's hundreds of thousands, millions of those that you can serve. If you want to serve that problem set, now you've got a, a whole different set of 
uh, considerations about about stickiness and value and the bandwidth to consider uh, effort to buy connectivity to things they're already uh, doing and using. There's a whole different you know set of problems you you have to address. And so my push is always make sure you understand the problem you're trying to solve. Make sure you're super well equipped to solve it, and then do an honest and objective review of how you compete in that market and how you can compete sustainably in that market. Do not overestimate your ability to simply hire a great sales team and go in and disrupt the market. It's not it's not going to happen without a bunch of the foundational work done. Definitely. When you are looking at that, I think. Who, who you serve, like you said, is is very important, informs all your decisions. It's foundational. Now, it also informs how you sell, right? Like you're selling to SMB, like you said, you, know, you can hammer the phones, you can do inbound. When you're selling to enterprise, it's a completely different strategy. And if you chase too many shiny objects as an early stage company, you can you can suffer and pay heavily for it. But um, so we dove into c- customer segmentation. What's your definition or recommendation for building a sales team, right? Like, is it sales ops, SDRs, lead qualification reps? What is the best way to achieve it all under mm-hmm. limited resources? Depends on where you're selling into and and. Uh, Let, let's and... let's say what what does your team for SMB look like versus yeah. like... SMB fits the same kind of consideration set as narrow versus wide value prop. So if you're going to sell uh, a product or service that has a very narrow, unique value proposition that you can uh, lead with product, then, you know, my push continues to be B2B buyers, uh, B2C buyers simply want to understand how products work before they buy now. And, And it's not as simple as free trials, but you've got to figure out your point of view on how you layer in product led growth to your to your distribution engine and to your sales engine you can build a sales team on top of uh, product-led growth absolutely all of the great product-led growth teams uh, and companies are building sales teams on top of what they originally built and that's a that's a natural progression Um, but if you're going to be down market you know my push still is to make sure you're building a product that a, a buyer can understand easily can implement easily uh, can hook into current systems easily and that with a little bit of coaching right that your sales team ends up being your yes our team ends up being coaches more than sellers a little bit of coaching can see real value out of that that product set now flip that with you know a company like adp that still has a small business team that goes out and knocks on doors uh, there's still room for people executing against door-to-door uh you know outbound calling you can you can build that i think it's just it's not where we're going. So you can build it and it helps you, you know, you know get your first number of customers. But over time, if you're going to, you know, serve down market, I would, I would lean into, you know, how you can leverage product like growth. And again, it's not as simple as just a free product offering. It's, it's a, it's a bigger concept. As you move up market, I do think you end up with the scale of a, a true B2B, B2C sales org where you actually have, I think you need smart analytical, you know, data folks that are running in ops, because I don't think you make any decisions uh, today without science, right? Selling used to be, you know, all art, very little science. I think for a while there, we tried to make it all science, no art. It's a bit of both. I think you need data and analytics folks. So you have to have a really strong sales ops leader. And sometimes it starts with one person who's just uh, super capable. Um, I still do think there is a there is room for folks that are uh, uh, actually you know uh, skilled and interested in, in creating and building demand. And so whether you call it an SDR function or a coaching function, uh, our BDR function, there's still room for that. And then of course, the folks that are, you know, best at engaging and, sh- and sharing the value and understand the, the buying uh, behaviors of the market you're trying to sell to. And of course, as you move true enterprise, it's an entirely uh, different dynamic and, and set of investment levers to get that right. Definitely. At what point does it make sense to hire sales reps, right? Like, let's say you have a product that's, I don't know, is that $7,000 ARR per year? Or ARR is at ten thousand? Is that twelve thousand? At what point you're like, I'm just going to focus on PLG and and feel the inbound with with light customer success versus I think I need to hire a sales team. It's test, 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 right? It's this idea that if you have a product and stand on its own and sell uh, without a lot of sales engagement for you know ten thousand ARR, then you know keep keep pushing on it until 
you until your uh, until your demand and and return starts to slow down and break, and then you might need to layer in people. The other the other option might be you've got this really lightweight product, but it actually needs 20 minute touch base in order with a real person in order to actually get it sold. But you know you can hire a sales rep and they can run 80 of those calls a week and 40 of them turn turn into sales. Awesome. If it can't be done without a sales rep and you can get the productivity, go for it. So it's all about testing what your return is on those PLG or person-centric kind of selling motions. The environment we've operated in, when I think about we, ADP, Salesforce, HubSpot, Venna, the one part of the more recent experience I have with HubSpot and Venna is the, the products themselves aren't very expensive, but the level of change required to implement them to truly get HubSpot in the door as a, as a, a cross-functional CRM or to get Venna in the door as the primary tool to have a company plan and run their, comp- and run their company, there's a lot of work in change man- management. There's fear. So even though the products themselves have a relatively low average ARR uh, against many other B2B softwares, the sales energy is high and the level of trust you have to build through that is high. And so, so while we're continuing to lean into product-led growth initiatives, we know our engine still needs people to truly coach and win, uh, win the trust of, of folks. And the buyer is not yet going to buy without truly engaging with our our brand. And that's going to shift over time, but that's our point point in time view. And I can see, you know, in our market, as we saw even with HubSpot, that the 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 use case and the understanding of when you would use a planning platform like Venna starts to, you know, shift, everybody understands it. The risk is diminishing while the value is increasing. And pretty soon I think people are going to be testing our product and buying it without ever speaking to anyone. And that's where I think our market's going. And I think it's going to be the same in, uh, with most companies and, and almost all softwares, you know, moving more and more to how do you use people really effectively and how do you use code really effectively to build trust? Because it's, it's all about a trust and momentum equation. That's all we're trying to build as companies. And, uh, and there's a few nuggets here. One, particularly, it's, it's not one size fits all. So you got to talk to your customer uh, understand what the selling motion is. So what's really interesting is Superhuman, the email product that's very, very popular. It's $30 a month, but they have an onboarding specialist and people think it's bonkers, but they'll get to hundred million in revenue with, with this onboarding specialist model where you need somebody to onboard um, and, and close and, and get that over, over the hurdle here. But like if they're doing 80 onboardings a week, then, then it's hyper-efficient. Now, a, a couple of questions here. One around, just to wrap up the conversation around your ideal customer profile and segmentation, what are best practices in defining ideal customer profiles, your ICP, um, from your experiences at Venna, HubSpot, Salesforce? A couple of things jump out is, is obviously there's a whole bunch of, you know, personal work you can do is uh, in, into, you know, who you're selling to and um, uh, the value you're creating for them and the work they do, right? The jobs they have to get done and how you help them get their jobs uh, done. Um, my you know, my push is, you know, definitely dig in, dig into framing your, pers- your uh, personas, but it all goes back again to just clearly and articulately defining the problem set that you're solving and understanding uh, how that foots against how folks are typically solving that now. And if you decide that you are, you know, in our case, we're best, we're currently best at solving the problems that a typical FPNA team will see as they try to uh, run and plan and build their business. And so we have a point of view, uh, who sits in that buying uh, team and what role they play in the decision and also how our, our solution kind of meets the needs of the individuals and the company. And we've decided that we, you know, we are going to primarily focus on folks in, in, in operations and finance, and we're going to primarily focus in the core mid market where we think we have a really unique way of positioning the value of Venna and a really effective way of selling it. So that's kind of how we've decided to define our ICP. And so we still do get leads from, you know, sales ops leaders and marketing ops leaders and HR ops leaders, and we actually will still engage, but we want to be really certain that they understand what we'll do and what our limitations are against their interests. And we try to do that upfront through uh, through marketing and education rather than putting them in front of a sales team where we know if we get a director of FP&A who happens to be you know, 
a SaaS FP&A director, $100 million company that's scaling, you know, that ticks all the boxes for us. And obviously ICP uh, weighting goes way up and we, we cycle those as fast as we can. Again, it's focus on that problem set you're trying to solve and the buying influences involved in their, their interest and in how you solve their particular problems. And then uh, and then wire your go-to-market and your product against that ICP, which is a little yeah. different than saying, hey, build a product and then figure out who your ICP is. Because I know there's a, that happens sometimes too. Um, but the best way is to define your problem set then and who you're solving that for, really narrowly focused on doing it really well for them. Make sure that problem set's big enough and the target audience is big enough that you can build a business around it. Solve that, understand that, define that, uh, build your entire uh, engine and motion against that. And go to market follows. I, I want to take some audience questions here and then we'll go back to rapid fire. But what are some strategies to ensure that customers still trust you post sale? Because in a sales role, sales <laughs> is almost always available using all channels, chat, everything else. But post sale, the customer is passed to customer success and onboarding. So, how do you sort of create these boundaries so the team isn't being hounded at all hours of the day, but as a result, the customer also doesn't lose trust. A couple things. The first one and the most obvious is promise the value you provide and del deliver on that promise. Don't promise value beyond what you provide. Expectation setting and selling to the right customers uh, and, and selling the right solution. I know that seems simple, but I will tell you it's just not the case um, that it naturally happens. So much about the DNA of a sales engine, I won't even say a, a person, is wired to solve for their targets and their goals. And through that, uh, there can be behaviors that are less uh, nefarious than, than you might think, but are a natural consequence that is if someone's willing to say yes, the entire engine is willing to say yes as well without maybe pushing or uh, pulling on what the customer is saying yes to and what they think they're signing up for versus what we've got to offer. And so there's a real uh, importance as you're building out uh, your metrics and your measures and the way you compensate folks to make sure that the front end, the sales engine and the marketing engine understands the importance of implementation retention and that you, you somehow tie their, their compensation, their target setting to whether or not customers are happy and sticking around. I think you just have to do that early because I, like I said, it's just the DNA of a sales engine is to uh, say yes early and often if the customer is willing to pay you. And sometimes that's just not the right way to go. So dig in deep and get the expectations right. The next is to, as a, as a business, as a company, to actually agree across the entire leadership team and ideally the whole culture, that the first experience, uh, deep experience with the product and the team supporting the product is the most important part of the journey. We build trust and credibility through the sales and marketing motion. We eventually get commitment, but the way you build a customer for life is get them off uh, to the right start. And so as you're thinking about all of the implementation motions in your engine, you've absolutely got it get it right. You've got to set the right expectations. You've got to have the right level of engagement for what a customer bought and how difficult it is to set it up. And you have to over-index as a company, especially early stages, you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 million in AR. You have to over-index in a company on customer success through that, through that early implementation. And it's okay if those customers once in a while go back to the sales team, but the reason they're going back to the sales team is because they don't feel the promises made by the sales team are being met. And so you can, you can overcome some of that natural friction by making sure the sales team continues to set the right expectations. And the idea that when someone signs a multi-year contract or a three-year or two-year, whatever you end up signing is it creates, it almost like it creates this false sense of security, right? Companies who typically are early on selling month to month, knowing they can lose the customer at any time are a little maybe over index a little more on those early months um, whereas companies that sign multi-year contracts think they've you know they've got them locked and it's less important I think it's even more important when someone makes a multi-year commitment to get the the front edge uh, right because then they don't feel like you've locked them in they feel like you're actually invested in committed uh, success so I want to take one question here on talent and culture, and then I want to take three in rapid fire. Sure. So a big part, and we, we talked about this at the beginning before we hopped on, was it's, it's product, it's culture, and it's company, right? So we talked a lot about product uh, and your customer as a part of that. Let's dive into culture because a big part of what you do is culture. But I, I want to address this one question here, uh, which talks about how important was candidate culture fit at ADP, HubSpot, and SF? 
when scaling your sales team. And maybe I'm gonna make a controversial statement here that I feel personally that culture fit is the biggest BS trope in the history of all business, right? And, and it's, it's being used as a term to gatekeep, like hiring has become gatekeeping and you're using the term, people use end up subconsciously using the term culture fit as a way to keep out people. And openness is the most indispensable enabler of growth. And it's about culture ad versus culture fit. So what's your take on that? I, I threw out something very controversial here <laughs> and I'm going to probably get a lot of flack for it. But how should you, like, as you think about talent and culture, what does culture mean to you? And in what yeah. order do you hire people from 10 to 100 million? The, the call out on culture fit is, is a good one. If you orient towards culture fit, it's probably, you know, it's better than uh, defaulting to top performers who you just know are going to be culturally corrosive, right? You don't want top performers that are going to be cor corrosive. But the idea that, you know, people hide behind the term culture fit to allow for kind of sameness to propagate, right? You just kind of, uh, and, and again, it's, it's it, it, sometimes it's completely unconscious. It's that, hey, Here's a source, either a, a school or a company where we've seen, you know, great candidates come and succeed and they do the role really well. So now we're just going to keep going back to the well. And so there's a natural inclination to keep going to where you've seen success in the past. And that to an extent is understandable. But as you think about solving problems of the future being different from the problems that you currently face or the ones you face in the past, you've got to start getting uh, leaning in uh, pretty pretty heavily to thinking about the dimensions of diversity you are purposely layering into your culture. And one of the things that, uh, one of the questions I got asked when I joined HubSpot, uh, HubSpot was, uh, you know, pretty well covered uh, in local media on East Coast of the U.S. and a uh, local tech blogger there that was spending time with me as a head of sales. And he said, you know, cult culture is so important here at Cups HubSpot. You, it's one of the key differentiators right now. How are you guys going to, you know, keep this, this wonderful culture intact as you scale? And the answer was, if we keep the culture intact as we scale, we're, we're going to fail. And uh, because as you think about the culture you're building today, um, as a brand new startup, then at 5 million in AR, then at 50 million in AR, then at 500, they're actually fundamentally different cultural levers that are at play. And you need, a, you need an evolving culture. And, and not only does the, you know, the requirements of a company uh, change as the, as the diversity of the markets they're serving change, as the problem set changes, um, but the communities around us and the kind of world around us continue to evolve as well. And your culture has to be a kind of a reflect, reflection of the best that you want to be. And so as I think about, you know, uh, a scale and hiring and managing culture, it's always through this, I, this lens apply, and I've historically applied, is thinking about all of the dimensions of diversity. It isn't just about gender or ethnicity. ethnicity. It's, there's, there's myriad dimensions of diversity you have to, that you have to consider as you're building out a culture and a team. But then most importantly, underneath that, I'll use a term that's, you know, tends to be something I've said a bunch, but it's this idea of building in systemic inclusion. And inclusion isn't just, you know, a, a set of values or a state of mind. Inclusion is how do you build all of the operational frameworks to ensure that your candidate pool is diverse and that your uh, pay and promotion structures are equitable, that your interview process, that your uh, events, that your participation in broader community efforts, that that has uh, all of the dimensions of uh, inclusion that matter and that are addressing um, you know, unconscious bias and systemic bias has been built up because it served your purpose when you're smaller and you're growing and now it doesn't serve the purpose and how do you continue to evolve that and one of the most difficult thing I think for founders, especially and, and founding teams is when you were five people or even 10 people in a room, you almost all had to think the same because you were trying to build something to solve a specific problem problem and you had a specific point of view and you better have like six or seven or eight awesome people around you that share that point of view and want to make a, a difference in the world and they think all the same because you have to build enough momentum to break through and do something special and then pretty soon having all the people thinking the same becomes a real friction point in a company now you're thinking that sameness hurts kind of okay at the beginning because we all had to be aligned and really fight the idea that we tell 
100 people, 200 people, 300 people, you all have to think this way and act this way, and we're all going to run this direction, will fundamentally always fail because your problem set is no longer narrow and simple. It, it becomes big. It is now a system. It's now a company, not a set of you know individuals all trying to change the world. It's a break without, without purposeful development of, of systemic inclusion, of these kind of frameworks for inclusion that then... Uh, invite diversity, right? Invite a bunch of dimensions of diversity into the engine, and then allow you to solve these really complex problems that you didn't have before as you as you were uh, scaling. So I agree with you. A bit of a trap. Uh, thinking about culture evolution, culture add, you know, culture amplification. There's a bunch of ways to frame it, but what you're looking to do is bring on people who are going to challenge. Again, not be culturally or values corrosive but are going to challenge the way you're thinking about moving forward and that you're going to invite that challenge and make sure that, you know, you're one team, one purpose, but you're many voices. And how do you, how do you uh, uh, absorb all of that uh, experience and knowledge to better the culture and the company as you move forward? So let's, uh, let's take a few questions. Uh, but one of the questions here is your mission, vision, values. What is the most important? To your organization, I, I'm going to push. I'm going to push on mission or purpose. Uh, once you understand that, of course, you build cultural values around it. But you really do have to have a sense of purpose. My view is that without a really clear sense of purpose, eventually the hurdles and the obstacles and all the difficulty about building a company beat you up because you're you're you don't see uh, the broader purpose and why we're doing it, and that, that gives you the strength to overcome. Um, so I think that runs first. Awesome, and then. For startup SaaS businesses, where do you recommend to focus? Like focus is a key thing and you know you shouldn't get dragged by shiny objects. What is your recommendation for focus? Early on in SaaS business, you kind of have to, once you've defined your product, your, your problem set, you've built what you think is a good product. Yes, you have to kind of attack all the shiny objects because you're trying to survive, right? You're trying to get revenue, you're trying to test. You do have to start to sell and start to uh, take make commitments and take commitments and see how you play out. So early on, you really do have to be ready to say yes. But there is a scale up to uh, you know, kind of scale up transition, right? So scale up is getting great at saying no and saying yes on your own terms. Early on, it's it's tough. Those the yeses tend to be you know a, a much more prevalent than the noes, and that's okay. But no, when you're starting to shift and how you have enough data now to narrow in and be honest and truthful. Don't just chase the, the big dollars. If it turns out that selling 10, $10,000 deals is significantly healthier for you and what you can actually deliver the promise you've made than selling $100,000 deal, then start selling lots of those. And that's the idea of like being objective and honest with data as to what you can solve effectively and, and how your customers are reacting to what you're offering them. Definitely. When is the right time to go international or global? Again, I'd say it depends on the pull, right? The, the, the market and the pull. If you're getting natural pull, then there's an opportunity to do it. The question about whether you use partners or go direct is really interesting. But I will think the, I will say that uh, regardless of where your, your home base is, let's assume for now our home base is North America and you're thinking about growing international, a very typical easy path is, you know, uh, obviously English speaking international challenge that every company has when they go truly international is they forget that they're, they're not going international. They're going global with local delivery expectations. So you go global by understanding the, the three, four, five, six markets that you want to play locally. You can't be a North American company selling in France, for example, without understanding what it would be, what it means to sell locally in France. It's not just translating your product or translating uh, your, your blog. It's a significantly bigger cultural uh, discussion. And so be thoughtful about that is get it right locally. Don't think about just international expansion as a whitewash. You have to actually think about local nuance and get that right. And if it's too much energy, focus back on what you do now and wait till, wait till you can actually afford uh, and have the resources to be local in a global environment. That's perfect, right? Because wherever you go, you have to feel like you are the person there. Otherwise, uh, people feel like they're dealing with uh, same, sameness is a thing, right? People like to work yeah. with people they like. And, and so local is a, is a key when you go international. Now, when do you add more product lines? Um, like it's so nuanced, but I'd say if you've got a great product with a narrow value proposition and you still have, you know, 90% of the market to go after, you don't need to add another product line. You still have lots of room to go and you can keep evolving your product. Awesome. Go for it. Lots of people get to a point where, 
uh, you know, at a certain market penetration, five, 10, 20%, then they know they have to start going wider and that's a really natural uh, state. But uh, my view is assess it at the time, understand whether or not you actually have leverage with your current buyer to go wider, whether they have a bigger uh, bigger attachment to wallet, you know, spend than, than they're giving you and that the, your direct line there can create real natural value. If that's easy and you can do it and you can build it, then awesome wallet share is always easier to build uh, typically than uh, than new logo share. And so a good strategy, but I, I just like, again, you got to have a lot of customer relationships before switching to uh, a multi-product strategy works. Awesome. And the, and the last question here, but almost every company you worked at is a platform company. And there's a lot of confusion between like, everyone says they're a platform, but they're not. Um, what is a platform and when, when should you start thinking about becoming a true platform? Is that post hundred million ARR? Like Salesforce waited until probably a, a billion before they started thinking about being a true platform. At HubSpot, we were we were starting to think platform at 100 million. I've seen lots of, uh, Venna, in fact, when we, uh, Venna was launched as a platform before it was a product. Um, so it factually went the other way as like, there was this wonderful flexible platform that could kind of do anything. And then, then our job now is to actually start productizing it a little bit. Uh, so it really depends on what you've built, what your market looks like. It's coming, it's coming sooner and sooner though. This idea that you can build product really now right now that is truly open that people can really easily hook into and create value around the fact that you can do that so easily now means people can start to think platform start to think ecosystem a lot sooner than you could two three four years ago it's just getting easier and easier the problem is everybody wants to be a platform and the and the opportunity might then be for people just to build really kick-ass narrow value propositions and go sell lots of it while everyone else is trying to build a platform over top of each other you, you got to figure out where like i say where where the world is going not where it is today and right now everyone's trying to build platforms yeah, definitely. I love that. Build one, do one thing really well. Uh, one kind of customer coming through one kind of channel, getting one kind of value. You can get to hundred million doing that. Don't chase Absolutely. shiny objects. Absolutely. Yep. Effectively HubSpot did that for hundred million, right? Like marketing automation sold through community, self-serve one kind yep. of customer. SME. Right to yep. Totally right to hundred million. And uh, a company like, think about it, a company like Intuit, you know, built a $4 billion business selling kind of the same thing just in the U.S., Great then, and, stuff for company, and then went then went big, right? It's and like, went platform because now you have this data set. Who else can sell to your customer base, and they build apps and products on top of it? Fantastic conversation, Hunter. I could keep you for two more hours, but I'm going to let you go. Thanks for joining us, sharing all these insights. Uh, what a wonderful journey! What a wonderful human. Thanks for thanks for your time today and insights. Awesome. Well, it was it was so fun to be with you all, and, and yeah, hope to connect with a bunch of the community that you're building. It's awesome.